Boy, it's a great song. Solid Gold on the 91 Rock Beach Party. Wes Green, Nick Archer along on a Sunday afternoon. And oh. <laughs> a special guest has arrived. In the studio. Isn't this exciting? I yes, ladies and gentlemen. I haven't been in Nashville in years. And All of you... Undoubtedly, remember this voice. Yeah, a star from the '60s here in Nashville radio. They used to call me the Burger Boy. The Burger Boy. Back when I did the commercials for the Burger Boy <laughs> restaurants, and of course they uh, they had to close down the restaurants, and uh, they of course did away with the commercials as a result. Well, how did you ever get this job? Uh, did you uh, audition for the uh, job as a uh, Burger Boy, or? No, I had sex with the program director. <laughs> That's the way I got it. Oh, me. 60s. Not bad. That was great radio. That was really great radio here in town. The Burger Boy, and there were a lot of other people uh, around town as well, uh, moving in and out of radio stations, uh, strange people that uh, many of us remember. Captain Midnight. Walrus. Well, Ruby Posey was a good friend of mine. I dated her for about three years till I found out about her past. Her past? I, yeah. Oh, what was wrong with her past? Well, it was uh, littered with various syringes. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Oh, so, and later I became, of course, the humble Herbert Bush. And when I moved, my family moved out into Bell Mead, and uh, I bought a gold bicycle that I rode into WMAK when I worked with Scott Shannon. Oh, on the you night know, program. That's right. You know all those people over there. Scott yes, Shannon. I had met Scott personally on several occasions. Is that right? You probably have some very good Scott Shannon stories. I think everybody who's lived here probably remembers Scott Shannon. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I've, probably everyone who's lived here has a Scott Shannon story, <laughs> at one point or another. But enough of uh, enough of humble Herbie and the Burger Boy. <laughs> Right? <laughs> That's right. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, Mike Donegan. Many of you uh, recognize uh, Mike's voice. Uh, does news on SM95 these days. But yes, back in the does. 60s, he used to do news and he used to jock a little bit, too, on uh, WMAK, which was uh, the big rock station here in Nashville. And the All-Americans. For all I know, you went to LS after that. No, not at all. was YMCA Law School, was it? I started at uh, MAK in 1968, answering the telephones and mailing out the all-hit music surveys. <laughs> really? <laughs> The ones with the little picture of Dick Ken on the front? Yeah. And I did this for uh, Dave Randall, who was the uh, nighttime jock at the time, worked 7 to midnight. Dave left, and they brought in a guy from uh, Albany, New York, named Johnny Walker. And his psychedelic Cadillac. Yeah, and he walked in the first night, and he said, I cannot read the news. And he said, I need somebody to do it. Donegan, come in here. So I went in there and started off by reading the weather. Did that for two weeks. You were the weatherman. I was, uh, well, really good at it. Really? I, I can say partly cloudy like the rest of them. And uh, after that, uh, became the nighttime news person. How exciting. Is it true you had problems saying W back in those days? I still have problems <laughs> saying W. <laughs> and WM combinations are rough. And I've worked at two stations with WMs, and I always uh, slurred the M. WM. Well, it's, it's easy these days. We just... <laughs> We just threw the W out, call this place 91 Rock. Makes That's it right. a lot easier for everybody. Well, if they move Nashville west of the Mississippi, you know, we could have K's. But <laughs> not so lucky. Unfortunately. Okay, well, I think what we're going to do, we're going to uh, take a take a few minutes here and go back uh, to the late 60s and uh, play a song that was really big on WMAK back in those days. I played this one myself. Remember when the group was on the opera, you say? Yes. Okay, we're back here on the 91 Rock Beach Party, and we have today a special you're guest. Saying, you're not saying it right. Uh, we're back here on 91 Rock. 91 Rock. Rock. Yes. Hold on. How about this? 91 Rock. Hey, <laughs> not bad. Special guest is Mike Donegan, who many right. of you know. As many the... of you don't know. But Mike was big. Uh, he was on uh, WMAK back during the 60s, big rock station here in town, and he's here to tell us his very favorite Russ Spooner joke. Russ Spooner? <laughs> well, Russ Spooner used to, uh, well, something I guess he got from some other radio station. <laughs> he did what was called the Spoonerisms, and he would uh, call up various people and Spoonerize them. I, rem I remember one in particular. He, he called the uh, called the Midtown Cinema. This was probably Nashville's first adult theater. He called them up uh, as a father of a young girl, and he said, Hey, I understand my... My daughter's in a movie down there. Can you tell me when it's showing? And, and the lady uh, said something like, uh, I, Do you know what theater this is, sir? <laughs> yeah, Midtown Theater. My daughter's in a movie down there. Tell me what time it's showing. She says, I don't think you want to see it. And this went on and on, and eventually uh, she hung up on him. 
<laughs> but he used to do stuff like that, and he called some barber shop trying to get a shoe shine uh, person there to uh, shine shoes on his monkey and various things. They eventually put out an album of spoonerisms. That's right. Very rare these days. Hard to uh, find. Yeah, they eventually put out Spooner. You know, I... <laughs> That's right. I did find a store that had five copies of that downtown, oh. one of those little stores. Oh, really? and, uh, and I hear that Russ Spooner came to town and personally bought up every copy of really? his record. Yeah. The right? guy says Russ Spooner came in and bought them all. That must have been a total of $7. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. Tell you what, we'll be back in just uh, a few minutes here. We got some, uh, got some music we want to talk about uh, back during the 60s uh, that was recorded here in Nashville. Some of the songs were very popular here. We'll be right back after this. And when we come back, you'll hear the story of Rick Stewart. Locking himself out of the control room. It's the 91 Rock Beach Party. Wes Green, Nick Archer, along with uh, Mike Donegan. Don't forget, request lines open, 322-3691. Something kinda, you want to hear? It's kind of cold here on the beach. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, it's Can draft. you turn down the air conditioner? Since we're on the 42nd floor. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> what you see here? The, 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 the beach is below. And uh, you get a lot of drafts up here. Up high. We're, we're by the pool. In the, yes. uh, the uh, Fabulous air. Hotel Fabulous. <laughs> Downtown Surratt, Tennessee. You can barely see the beach if you really take a good look. Local humor. A lot of smog. Yes. Okay. Um, 60s, perhaps uh, well known for uh, a lot of the uh, the touring bands used to have the music festivals, I remember here in town. Right. And, uh, the 1860s, I guess, were best known for the Civil War. Yes, probably but so. We won't course, get into that. Uh, time of uh, tumult in Europe as well. But right. That's history 100. And then they had three malt uh, 10 years later. Is that right? Right. Quasiary malt. Yes. <laughs> Secondary malt. <laughs> Boy, we're denigrating fast here. Huh? Okay. You've got some good stories. No, I don't. Some of the groups. <laughs> <clears throat> well, in that case, uh, you uh, you started reading the weather. Would you uh, like to read the weather? <laughs> it's like it finished that way. Huh? That's what you're saying. No, at any rate, I do remember something that happened uh, very tragic in uh, Mike Donegan's history back in the uh, probably 1969, the grassroots. One of my, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. One of your favorites. Absolutely. Uh, they had come to town for a concert one weekend, and uh, I think the concert was on Friday night. And on uh, Saturday night, I, I did a radio show from 7 to midnight. And I had uh, some guy call and say that he was, uh, I don't remember the name, but uh, so-and-so with the grassroots. Could I come up and be on the radio? I said, well, sure. Yeah, it's not often that I had celebrities on the show. You know, occasionally, uh, Rick Stewart would come in 10 minutes early. but uh, So I, I told the guy to come up and got, it, got him through uh, Otis, the elevator operator, and into the back door of the radio station. The guy came up, and I interviewed him for about an hour on the program as so-and-so of the Rick, of the, uh, it was Rick somebody, the grassroots, that's what it was. And uh, found out the next day that the grassroots had left town the day before that. <laughs> I had some imposter on the air. Never was, did find out who the guy was. Was he interesting? I remember he asked me for five bucks before he left. <laughs> Is that right? I was rooked. Oh, well. That's the way it goes. Okay, we'll be back in a few minutes here on the 91 Rock Beach Party. It's the 91 Rock Beach Party. West Green, Nick Archer, and Humble Herbert. Uh, live. How are you? From high top the fabulous Hotel Fabulous. Well, you know, uh, Wes, I... Uh... Yeah, my, I guess my big claim to fame, aside from being the burger boy and on the Scott Shannon program, was the night that I did Crying Time. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you yeah. do Crying Time one night? I did Crying Time one night. I, uh, I told the story of the guy who fell in love with the mannequin down at Harvey's in the Harvey's window, and he went up in the window there and was going to kiss the mannequin, and the mannequin's arm fell off. That's tragic. Yeah, it was a tragic story. Then I went into some... Uh, I guess I went into Get It On by Chase. <laughs> and uh, I did Crying Time only once, but usually you don't get much mail in broadcasting business, but uh, we got a lot of mail on that one. I'm and, sure you uh, did. That was a very popular program. I'm sure the, uh, the sales department loved that show. Yeah. Yeah, they used to have some Crying Time, too. <laughs> we won't go into that. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Changing the subject ever so slightly. And my voice. And your voice. Uh, there were a lot of uh, songs. People don't know this. Everybody knows that Nashville is a big country recording center, but a lot of people don't know that a lot of great 60s songs uh, were recorded here. Oh, really? Uh, a lot of arrangers. Yeah, you know, people like Tupper, Saucy, and Buzz yes. Case, and all those people operating in and around Nor Justice. Norrell Wilson, you'll remember him. Yes. and uh, <clears throat> The Beatles, I think, did most of their stuff here. 
Yeah, the, the Beatles did, and of course, uh, you remember that uh, great uh, composer Floyd Whitworth. Floyd Whitworth, <laughs> yes. Floyd, uh, Floyd was the big did, writer. Didn't he do uh, Lebanon in the Summertime? Yes, I think. <laughs> no, I think you've got that confused with Gallatin in the Winter. <laughs> <laughs> And, At any rate. And there was Romeo, Romeo, Mount Julia. <laughs> but we won't get into that. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, uh, yeah, a lot of these songs are recorded here. And um, you've uh, you've got a story about this song we're getting ready to play, do you? No, I have no story connected no. with this song whatsoever, except the fact that it was a, a group of... Uh, this was uh, late 60s, and there was there was a group of uh, of girl a singers. A group of girl. Girl singers. Mm -hmm. A group of girl singers. There was one girl, and they... Of course, they uh, let her do most of the parts. And uh, they played what were called at the time hops throughout oh, the city. Make a lot of beer out of that. You got enough. Yes, they did. But at any rate, uh, they had one hit record. It was kind of a, I guess, a local hit or a regional hit. And it was, uh, I forgot who did this first. Somebody else did this uh, did this song first. <laughs> Nick, Nick should know that. Nick is shaking his head in the other room. Doesn't have his headphones on. Oh, put your headphones on. Put your cans on. Okay, there we go. No, I have no idea who did this. It's it, the writers listed as Melinda Lou Dalton. Oh, she was another. Yeah, one. I knew yeah, all Melinda. three of them. That's right. Yeah. I remember her. Okay. Mm. And I think they wore leather jackets, and uh, most of them played the guitar, and one played the organ. I don't know if they had a drummer or not. I guess they got one for this song. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was called uh, what? It's called I've Been Working on You by the Feminine Complex. Yeah, somebody else did this song. I can't remember who. There you have Feminine Complex, not to be confused with Rivergate Mall. A, uh, it was a uh, all-female group back in the uh, late 60s here in Nashville. You played piccolo on that, didn't you? Yes, I did. I, I thought. Okay, it's the 91 Rock Beach Party, West Green, Nick Archer, along with uh, special guest Mike Donegan, Humble Herbert, and the Burger Boy on a Sunday afternoon. Talking about uh, great 60s radio in Nashville, Tennessee. Of course, the Beatles were real big in the 60s. They ain't got uh, so big. Who? Huh? Oh, the Beatles. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go on. At any rate, the Beatles were real big. I remember uh, Johnny Walker, who was the nighttime disc jockey on WMAK, uh, when Hey Jude came out. Of course, the big thing was to interpret... What, what does uh, that song mean? What Hey Jude was all about. And mm -hmm. Walker got really involved in the thing. He spent... Uh, had a whole six-hour show devoted to Hey Jude. I think they played it 19, 1,900 times at various speeds and backwards and phased it a few times. And uh, later, he got so the the show got so involved that he uh, he had so many requests that he did a seminar at I think the public library on the meaning of Hey Jude. Had a couple of professors from from Vandy over there, and uh, as it turned out, it you know it was I think it was uh, the whole song was just about uh, Drugs and stuff. I see. But it completely <laughs> changed his life. It changed his life. He went from a uh, mild-mannered disc jockey to uh, to a rodeo uh, to Baltimore performer. <laughs> yeah. to, to this date, he still rides. Oh, very interesting. Hey Jude, I didn't realize. That. I don't remember that. I remember that. I remember the day that Dick Kent uh, broke uh, the copy of uh, Tiny Tip Tip Throw Through the Tulips. He actually did not break that song. Now, he that's, didn't. That's a falsehood that has been carried out through a. Uh, Oh, National great. Radio. Well, this, is, this is the show that gets to the bottom of these mysteries. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> See, the problem was we only had one copy of the record. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had to play one copy on the air. So he actually broke Old Rivers <laughs> by Walter Brennan. Oh, is that right? A lot of people don't know that. Nice. That's very interesting. Dick Kent doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> he was a bit suspicious when they played it again the next day. One of my, uh, one of my uh, idols, I guess, in Nashville radio was Jack Sanders. The late Jack Sanders, and uh, I remember when he was on WMAK, he carried on the tradition of locking yourself into the control room, and he had a song out that he performed. I think it was called Vietnam Blues. It was a anti-war song. And one afternoon, about uh, three o'clock, I guess he did afternoon drive at the time. He uh, locked himself in the control room, supposedly, and played Vietnam Blues over and over again for like two hours. The problem with the locking himself in the control room was that there was no lock on the control room door. So a lot of people listening didn't know that. But <laughs> there was no way he could have locked himself in the control room. Another legend uh, there uh, smothered. And then who was it who came along and uh, 
continued the legend uh, slightly uh, modified by locking himself out of the control room. Oh, that was uh, Rick Stewart, the oh. head, we call him the head hooter, <laughs> the night owl. He did the all-night show at, at MAK. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Scott Shannon used to, on occasion, tape, pre-record. <laughs> the whole show. No, the last hour of his show. Oh. Scott liked nightlife, and he mm. liked to, you know, get out before everything closed. So he would uh, pre-record the last hour of his show. I think it was called the Power Hour. Oh, yes. And... Uh, Walrus Mike Bohan would help in the production of that. And uh, he always, at the end of the tape, would put several Beatles songs, which if he was listening to the radio, he could always tell when Rick Stewart was late because the Beatles songs would come on. <laughs> so one night, shortly after midnight, we heard about four Beatles songs in a row. I was driving uh, on my way home, I guess, out West End. Mike Bohan was on his way home uh, out Gallatin Road. Scott Shannon was at at some undisclosed location, and uh, we all heard the Beatles songs at the same time. We all headed back to the station. We got there at about the same time and saw Rick Stewart in the hall. He had left his key at home <laughs> and had been standing out there helpless for about 20 minutes. Well, let's talk, let's talk about music. What songs did you like in the 60s? Let's see. Just name a couple, and we'll see if we can dig them out of the box here. I like some weird ones. I, I used to collect oldies, and one I couldn't find for years was Bowling Green by the Everly Brothers, hey. which is a great song. It never was really a big hit, but it was just a great song. I had a whole lot of trouble finding it. And uh liked uh, Grassroots. Those were good. The famed Heaven Knows was one of my great, uh, good, good one record. of my favorite oldies. Of course, we always, when we played that over the intro of the record, we would say, uh, now here's that big nostril in the sky. The heaven knows. You know. <laughs> okay, we have some grassroots around here. We'll play mm -hmm. a little grassroots music here. The grassroots, heaven knows, 91 Rock Beach Party. It's the 91 Rock Beach Party. Sunday afternoon request lines, of course, always open. 322-3691, along with Wes Green, Nick Archer, Mike Donegan, Burger Boy, la di da di da di da di da di da da If you have a in the sun, it's time to turn, you're going to burn. <laughs> Okay, and the topic this hour is... Dirty Records. Dirty Records. Yes, of mm -hmm. course. We, of course, we all know it was Arthur Godfrey who invented blue humor. That's true. Well, he wasn't didn't invent it, but he used it heavily on the radio in Washington, D.C. That was before my time. Yeah, right. You and Nick, of course, will remember that. I think we're still before your time, Wes. <laughs> but hopefully next week. At any rate, uh, blue humor was real big in radio for a period. The champion here in uh, the champion here in Nicheville was uh, Alan Dennis, who could always get away with a dirty joke. And uh, your favorites are no, no. Some of them are just really too uh, too much. But uh, had blue records too, though, didn't they? Yes, we did. We had some blue records. Uh, of course, there was the... Uh, Most of them were black, but there were a few. The great one by Brenton Wood, the Oogum Boogum song, which if you listen to the last the last few uh, seconds of that song, it's uh, really strange. A lot more than Oogum Boogum. Yes, it is. Let's see. <clears throat> and, of course, we have a, a classic on the turntable here. There was Louie Louie, which everybody remembers, by the Kingsmen. Yes. He used to play that at 16, you know, and write down the lyrics. It wasn't dirty at all. Wasn't it? No. What was it about? It was, you know, just your basic love story. About Louis. Yeah, about Louis, a guy named Louis. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, there were some people who uh, got away with it by uh, singing songs in foreign languages. Yeah. Actually, the, it wasn't the foreign language that was so much dirty. Although you have told me since that uh, there is something in that record that could be taken as dirty in the uh, French context. But uh, there was a lot of heavy breathing on this song. I love it. We played it for about three weeks <laughs> till somebody caught on. Ira North told you to take it off. So, uh, how is everything with you, Wes? <laughs> Just fine. Okay. Here, here's the song we're talking about. Boy, am I going to get in trouble. <laughs> I like pronounce this. What is this guy's name? Sergey? I guess it's pronounced Sergey Gainsbourg Serge. Sergey. That's a dog food. Sergey yeah. Gainsbourg. Jane Birkin. Je t'aime moi non plus. 91 Rock Beach Party. That song made, made me salivate. I Did just it? may say that. Could I? 
Certainly, go right ahead. Thank you. Now about voices. Uh, a lot of voices in the 60s. A lot of disc jockeys had uh, voices and characters most, they used most to Most of the disc jockeys I knew had voices. A lot of drama. There were, there were some who did not have voices. We won't go into them. But no, there were some disc jockeys who had characters that they would change their voice slightly. Some of them would not change it at all. For example, at WMAK, we had Dick Kent, who had uh, Ruby Posey. Who will never forget? Who will ever forget uh, Ruby Posey? I have. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and uh, no. there was uh, Johnny Walker, who had Rex King, the world's only singing weatherman, along with his trumpet. Rex would uh, play guitar, had a country voice, and he would go partly cloudy, you know, and fair and young stuff like that. <laughs> Sonny and Cher, you know. And he would always he would read uh, read some one-liners. Uh, he would talk about the uh, the guy who was stopped uh, for a traffic ticket on one-way street. And the officer would ask him, didn't you see the arrows? And he said, no, I didn't even see the Indians. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and then the guy, would, uh, the, the guy said that the officer asked him if he, uh, or reminded him that if he said anything, it would be held against him. So, of course, he said, Raquel Welch. <laughs> Which yes, well, resulted in a recent song by somebody, mm -hmm. I think. But and, uh, there was uh, Dr. Al Adams, who had a talking duck. I remember him over yeah. at WKDA. Yeah, yeah. Al Adams was on against uh, Johnny Walker at night, and I remember they had a big controversy over the uh, the song "Inagata De Vida." So you could only play "Inagata De Vida" once a night because it was like 18 minutes long, and you had a lot of commercial time to fill. So there was a big uh, fight over Walker and Adams over who would play it first. And you couldn't play it until after 9 o'clock because the commercial load was so heavy from 7 to 9. We don't lose money, do we? No. no. So it got to be 8.59, then 8.58, 8.57. I think eventually they started playing it at 7 o'clock. <laughs> had to be such a, uh, such a controversy. That was a big song here. Only hit the group ever had. <laughs> they vanished. Another, they still play it, don't they? Another famed character in Nashville radio was Jack Kane's Dirty Shirt. Jack Kane's Dirty Shirt? Yeah. Jack Kane was the one who had a little box of uh, cards. That's uh, Most of his material was on the cards. I see. Wolfman Jack does the same thing, by the way. I didn't know. Does he really? What, he reads he his stuff off cards? Index cards. Has a little box of index cards. Uh, my fourth yeah. grade teacher told me to do that, but I never, never got in the hang of it. Right. Write down everything you're going to say on index cards, and your report will sound a lot better. I've tried to do that, but I can't read. So, Turn the card around. <laughs> that's it. Or, I, well, opening the box would help, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's great. A lot of... I'm glad you think so. Yeah, that really is. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? We'd love to have guests on our show. We'll play music now. Three two two three six nine one. If you have a request you'd like to hear, okay. Well, well, let's go to Mike now and get another request. What's what's another song? Just pick one. This is uh, your show, so to speak. Just pick a song. Mm -hmm. Any song. Well, any song from an oldie sixties. Uh, how about "Oh How Happy" by Shades of Blue? That's a good one. Okay, here it is on the ninety one Rock Beach Party. It's the ninety one Beach Party. Wes Green, Nick Archer, along with Mike Donegan on a Sunday afternoon. How you doing? Got uh, some great music for you until 6 o'clock. And our special guest, Mike Donegan, is here to talk about his favorite record of all time. You're probably wondering how I got into radio. Yes. <laughs> did we forget to ask that? Yeah, we did. <laughs> well, it was something I really started when I was about 8 or 9 years old. Of course, I had my own radio station at home. It was WQBH. Oh, really? Yeah. What does QBH stand for? I can't tell you. Why not? Well, I just can't tell you on the air. Oh. But at any rate, I did not know at the time that there was a WHBQ in Memphis. And uh, later was totally destroyed when I found out about that because it was so similar to QBH. But I had a little 10-watt oscillator, and I could broadcast over about four houses. And I had a whole line of, a, of disc jockeys. Really? I had a station like that when I was a kid. Did you? Yes, it was WBOD. Yeah. I and Brentwood. That. Yeah. Big station. Right. Used to get all the way into Overton High School. Anyway, go ahead. So uh, I had to get records to supply a WQBH with. And where did I get those records? Shoplifting. You ask. <laughs> Some of them I purchased with my own cash. But uh, the others I got from uh, John Richburg, who did, uh, John R. did the night show at WLAC for many years. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was very kind, let me come up to the studio at night and go through all the old rejects. And I'd get a box of records and take them home. 
And uh, some of those records turned out to be hits later. When I went to work for MAK, I played some of them uh, as oldies. And uh, one of them was not a real big hit in Nashville. And I used to do Sunday mornings, prime time on the weekends. Did uh, Sunday mornings on uh, WMAK where we played such programs as the Sacred Heart Hour, which was only 15 minutes long. And uh, I'd dig out some of my old oldies and uh, play them on the Sunday morning show. One of them I played was But It's All Right by J.J. Jackson. And the program director, Joe Sullivan, uh, brought me into his office one day. He was going over our program to tell us how we were doing. And he came to this song, But It's All Right by J.J. Jackson. He said, that's a terrible song. It was never a hit, and don't ever play it again. So I immediately told Johnny Walker about that. Walker said, that's a great song. I'm going to play it. So, so, so are we. He played it about once an hour every, uh, every night for about two weeks. The thing became a monster of a hit, went all the way up to number one in Nashville, and brought J.J. Jackson out of retirement and got a new album out. And later he had another hit called Little Dog Heaven just shortly after that. And it's all because of you. No. Because of John R. John R. John R. J.J. <laughs> Jackson. And it's all right. It's the 91 Rock Beach Party. Wes Green, Nick Archer, along with special guest Mike Donegan. It's a Sunday afternoon. Glad to have you along. And uh, as I said, our special guest this afternoon, Mike Donegan, who used to be with uh, WMAK. He's with... Uh, that other radio station now, but at any rate, used to be around back in the 60s on WMAK when they were so big as a radio station. Why was that? Back in those days, uh, MAK had uh, like 50% of the audience or some such ridiculous That thing. was not always the case. In the, in the mid-50s, WKDA was probably the first station here to play rock, and they were big for like 11 years. They really dominated the market. Doc Holliday was uh, the morning man. Bill Berlin, the wild child, did uh, did nights over there. Had a guy named Ray Lynn, who uh, did Afternoons, later had a hit record. Bill Craig, who used to do a thing called uh, the uh, Fun in the Sun show. It was kind of similar to this uh, beach party we're doing here. Uh, the Sorry only hear that. The only no, difference was he, he, he had a tape of uh, pool sounds. It sounded like he was at a pool at an apartment complex. Do we have one of those? We will. Next week. Really ought to get one. Sounds great. And... Uh, when he was talking in between the records, uh, you could hear all these people laughing and splashing in the water in the background. The only problem was occasionally he'd forget to turn off the tape. <laughs> and you'd hear the sound effects all the way through a record or through a commercial. Bob Cole was over at KDA, wasn't he, as well? We yes, all know. Bob, Bob Cole, Cole was over there. Well, Bob Cole. Why, why was Bob that? Bob Cole, I think, initiated the uh, underground effort here It. uh what was KDA FM? Mm -hmm. Yeah, later. Yeah, I think it was him and Jay Franklin and Hunter Harvey. <laughs> yes, people. still hunting for Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, later, uh, uh, MAK was owned by Lynn Broadcasting for years, and they were fairly successful. They were, they were, uh, I think it was known as the, uh, what were they known as back then? Big Mac. Big Mac. It was Big Mac. Big MAK. And uh, Lynn Broadcasting sold MAK to Mooney Broadcasting, and Mooney brought in Joe Sullivan from Knoxville, who was over WKGN. Joe was a, a brilliant person and a real entrepreneur. He is now with Sound 70, by the way. Yeah, I don't he, know that he he's uh, still around. Started Sound 70, yeah. And uh, Joe brought in some uh, highly talented uh, disc jockeys. He paid them pretty well. And, uh, you was, were one of those. Of was big on promotion. And uh, took over KDA just, just in a matter of a year and eventually turned WKDA from a rock station to a country station. But back then, there were really only two stations that were highly competitive for the radio audience. It was KDA and MAK. A really competitive thing. Uh, we, used to, we used to call up each other, you know, and say bad things and hang up. I remember uh, Dr. Al Adams, when he had his duck, we would call up and say... Can we speak to the duck? <laughs> you know, man, he'd probably call up and ask to speak to Humble Hervey. Why do you think that was? Back in those days, you only had two stations. And uh, in many towns, it was much the same way. You had one station or two stations that were very dumb, and you don't see that anymore. But everybody used to listen to MAK or uh, earlier KDA, and everybody yeah. used to listen to the same kind of music. And that was all the disc jockeys. Everybody knew who the disc we, jockeys were in those days, whereas nowadays, you know. The station, the station had a much more broad playlist back then we played stuff that 
you know, stations are highly specialized now. You just play rock music. We play a lot of country, a lot of easy listening. You know, it was a really a, a broad... Uh, Mass appeals. Broad appeal is what we were looking for. And it had a heavy in the personality. A lot of personality back then. You didn't play as much music as you, as you do now. What are you... What are your your own particular beliefs on that? I mean, would you like to see personality radio come back? I think, it, I think it has come back. I think... Uh, Not here yet, but... Well... <laughs> to, to an extent, but I mean, still, there... Not this show. <laughs> a lot of... Uh, no, there are a lot of major... Uh, a lot of major programmers in this country who still think that person, the music ought to come first and personality ought to be second. But. I think that's changing. I think as stations become more specialized, you have stations that feature uh, a lot of talking and very little uh, music. Some stations that play just music, and uh, some stations that have beach parties on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> okay, Mike Donegan, our special guest this afternoon. Okay, well, Mike, it's time for you to uh, uh, reach into your bag there and pick out another record. Okay, what do we got me, this uh, time? Let me get over to my bag. I just I brought my bag along, you see. Yeah. Uh, what have I got in here? Oh, there were there were a few good songs that were great to open the hour with. Real raunchy records. Top of the hour songs. Top of the hour hits. One of them was uh, Spirit, I Got a Line on You. That was always good. Hmm. Lighthouse, One Fine Morning. Bottle of Wine by Fruit the Fireballs. He, one of my favorites. Give me some lovin', Crazy Elephant. Remember that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, what was the thing by uh, Spencer Davis Group? I'm a man. That'll do. Uh, and uh, a group out of Miami called The Last Word had a real good hour opener. It's the 91 Rock Beach Party. Sunday afternoon, West Green, Nick Archer, and special guest, Mike Donegan. Yes. Humble Herbert. Yes. Uh, Gloria Marshall. Yes. <laughs> You know, I, I, I was kind of surprised. I've listened to your program on two occasions. And uh, it was kind of a shock for me to come into the studio and discover that both of you do this in the nude. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we feel we can get into the spirit of the, uh, the program yeah. a lot better. This is a beach party. I mean, who goes to the beach with any clothes on? Well, sure, sure. sure. I, of course, am wearing clothes. <clears throat> I want to make that clear. <laughs> I am wearing clothes. <laughs> Mike, thank you very much for coming by this afternoon. We have enjoyed this, and I hope a few people out there uh, are still listening. Hopefully, Gare is listening. <laughs> okay, special guest Mike Donegan. Thank you very much. Okay, and Mike, uh, for you late, one more record? Yeah, uh, the two minute and 42 second asthma attack by Ian Whitcomb. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> 